So you're hearing the word Accenture Interactive, and yet you're seeing on screen uh, Fjord. So just want to spend one or two moments talking about a little bit about what Chris brought up. Why are the consultancies of the world starting to bring in design partners? Uh, stay out of our lane, people, right? So Fjord is a service design firm that Accenture acquired about six years ago. So there, there came a point, and it was funny because I was called before Fjord was acquired. I've been a creative director my whole life. I've been in the agency space. I'm actually a copywriter by trade. If you ever saw back in the 90s and the early 2000s, I am's pet food commercials and Hyundai commercials. Yes, if you read about our food eliciting small firm stools and your dog, I probably wrote that. Um, and so I was called by Glenn specifically to recruit me in. And I was like, uh, Glenn, uh, you may not be aware of this, but Accenture's not creative. <laughs> I mean, they implement platforms, don't they? Isn't that what they do? He said, everything's changing. And I think now is the time for you to come in. Six years later, we can clearly, clearly see why. And Fjord is a service design firm, which was the first acquisition in that mold. Afterwards, there have been dozens of others to fill very specific pockets of need. Uh, there are a bunch of slides up front that I'm just going to skip through, but a couple of key ones. We view that we're now living in the era of what we call living services. It's not enough just to toss out a campaign and hope that there's recognition and power of recall. Right? People now expect services, not just campaigns, to respond in real time to their needs. Right? Think about the ecosystem of like the Nest thermostat, where you leave the house and it just redials, right? things like that. So organizations have to reinvent themselves that put humans at the center. And this is what Accenture was missing at the time, and all the consultancies were missing. So we look at the world through, uh, through two lenses in the consultancy world. There's what's under the surface. We use an iceberg. I think I have it here. We use an iceberg as a metaphor. There's what's under the surface. surface. I'm going to blow through this. And there's what's over the surface. Under the surface is what the consultancies have long been known for. Right? It's flex your platform, scalable and flexible technology. You might have heard a couple of years ago when healthcare.gov got all screwed up at launch. Accenture technologists came and swooped in and help save the day. And then there's people who are deeply embedded in industries, learning everything there is to know about an industry. So you have the deep industry knowledge, you have the strong technology, but a platform does not make an experience. People's needs and eliciting what those needs are and pain points are do. And what we do at Fjord and a number of other partners that have since been brought in is, among other things, a lot of deep ethnographic research actually shadowing current events to see what's going on, see what the pain points are, see what people need, and back into the technology instead of saying, oh, Salesforce, Salesforce can't do it, then you can't have that piece of service. No, we have to know what is the issue at heart, how do you design around that, and then how do you back into the given platform or technology. And if that plat platform or technology doesn't particularly have the features and functionality to elicit that experience, create some middleware in the middle to allow for it. But that's the blend. So now there's an over-the-surface component, right? There's what you also see. And those pieces now connect, which is why Accenture Interactive is scaring some agencies for sure, because it's not also about creating great experiences and having the technology, but doing this all at scale, right? Really, really being able to launch this stuff. So if you look at you know, the notion of the best customer experiences on the planet, that's because we can now envision and create. You're, you're, you're branding the business and the customer opportunity and product and interactions, and then there's the rest of it that the broader Accenture can fill in from there, the, all the marketing channels and campaigns, all the platforms, and then run and optimize as a service. Service. Together, that's really powerful. It's scalable, we can go big, we can go strong, we can bring in every grand component without things just being a technology play. So I just wanted to, to sort of tip that off because that is what's happening in the world now. Um, Accenture was lucky enough to sort of bring that to the fore a little bit earlier, but McKinsey, Deloitte, IBM, like all of the consultancies and tech players are now hiring in spades, thousands and thousands and thousands of designers at a time. You know, to sync it all together. I mean, you know, the first thing when I went around to Fjord, I was hired again at Accenture just before the acquisition, but they breathed the oxygen I was used to, so I quickly joined that piece of the organization. But when I was interviewing them, asking them how I felt about the acquisition, of course, they were thinking Darth Vader was going to ruin their culture, right? <laughs> the big bad consultancy is going to ruin their. No, we actually changed the culture of the broader organization. Uh, and Accenture Interactive is all about experience first and the rest of the company is going that way too. 
So every year, Fjord actually has about 1,000 designers. We live in 28 studios. Uh, closest one here is in Toronto. Um, and every year, we crowdsource from our 1,000 of designers what our companies and people and citizens of the world and governments and our fellow design community, what are we really, really concerned? What do we think is happening right now that's, that's going to in, uh, affect people and impact business? This is not about our view for what's happening 15 years from now or 20 years from now. This is about right now. This is about the things we see and hear. These are about the opportunities we get and certain things emerge. So we kind of do a tour of all 28 studios, we get the 300 or so ideas together, and we boil it down into these seven for today that I'll take you through. So uh, Silence is Gold is about the need for quietude amongst the digital onslaught of our lives, right? Which is counterintuitive to I know the marketing community, but look at, look at what Chris said earlier in the keynote. Who are the successful people? Not the people that are throwing more, dumping more campaigns, people who know impact instead of more. The last straw is about the need for sustainability. It now matters. Customers are making choices because of the sustainability stories that companies are telling, even if they think a product or service is lesser than a competitor. Data minimalism, what is the worth of data today? It's not much, it's not much. In the aggregate, it's worth a lot more, and I'll explore that. The inclusivity paradox, Ugh. as I read it, it sounds pretentious, but essentially what I'm getting at here is the death of traditional personas. Context is much more important than an individual persona. What if something happens to a customer? How do you relate to that contextual experience instead of just assuming they're in the work hard, play hard bucket so they will get these services and communications? So that's the paradox, right? Everybody talks about talking to the individual, but there are a lot of gaps, and I'll get into that. Ahead of the curb is all about our large cities' inability to deal with the mobility economy, right? The, the, I'm not talking about phones here, I'm talking about actual transportation and delivery. Um, everything's changing. Probably 10% of the population will be in about 41 cities in the, by 2030. That means a lot in terms of how we move around, right? Space Odyssey uh, is about workspace and retail space. Not that physical space is dying, particularly in the retail world, but it, physical space must be informed by digital. So the two have to work together. It's not an either or proposition anymore. And finally, synthetic reality. It's like, what are we actually dealing with? We're in a post-truth era. We read the news, we're horrified every day by what we see and hear. And now we have synthetic realities, voice swapping, face swapping technologies. What does it even mean to be authentic anymore? And with about 25 minutes left, I'll, do, I'll hit a couple a little bit harder than others. Uh, and at the end, I'll tell you a website where you can read about e e each of these with way more evidence, a lot of depth. Okay, silence is gold. So brands have to find a way to connect with consumers now that people are demanding quietude. Never before have we seen so many opt-outs and disconnects and a desire to get away from it all. And I'm not just talking about marketing messaging. I'm talking about digital. I'm talking about screen usage. I'm talking about the onslaught of messaging and digital bombardment that we get every day that's actually affecting mental health. Um, I say gold because there actually is monetary value to gain, be gained from the right kind of quietude, right? So let's get into it a little bit. I love this quote. The former editor of Wired Magazine said, the digital divide was about access to technology, and now that everybody has access, the new digital divide is about limiting access to technology, right? So I was just at the um, Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas, which is like Caligula with the stage. Oh my God, it's like crazy. The, uh, one of the things I noticed, though, as a trend, is a lot of companies actually are finding, they were selling or talking about software and hardware to limit usage of our screens. And the biggest evidence that this is now a thing is if you look in almost all contracts from Silicon Valley parents that they write in their nannies' contracts, it limits or eliminates screen usage, right? So the very people right, that have addicted us all to our screens are privately saying they're nannies, not a minute, right? Not a minute. That's happening right now. Uh, in England, the Ministerial uh, Health, uh, Digital Health Summit was just created. And at that, there was a lot of research that came out. One of them was that 63% of UK school children said they wish that social media was never invented. Um, so clearly the impact on our lives and our health uh, are, are weighing on us uh, quite a bit. 
So what's starting to happen now, Piece, pieces of evidence? See that video in the upper right? Those are called IRL glasses in the real world. A couple of guys invented it on Kickstarter. What it does is it eliminates the waves from LED screens, things like that. So you can walk into a bar in a mall, and suddenly the screens that were just blaring at you are gone. The whole idea is people have this innate desire to reconnect to the person next to them and not be bombarded anymore. And you can kind of see it. I think it reloads on the right. Yeah, so there's everything, and then puts on the glasses, and it's gone. Uh, they reach their funding in three days hundreds of thousands of dollars. There is an innate desire for this. Um, anybody remember the Palm Pilot? The Palm is back as a form of a light phone. It just has minimal functionality to just keep you connected. There are hotel services that now say, give us your phone, we will lock it away, and we will give you a dumb phone for the course of your vacation with us, right? And we have all experienced the horror and the personal shame of looking at our own Apple, our, our own iPhones and Google uh, uh, phones and seeing how much time we spend on screens. I think that the, the whole intent is to shame us into not looking at our screens. I mean, certainly works for me. Like, how is eight hours even possible in a five hour span? I don't know. <laughs> um, so at the end of each of these, I'm just gonna offer a couple of suggestions uh, from us and how we kind of feel about that and how to kind of think about taking this trend forward into some actionable uh, things. One is, of course, be quieter, right? Take a lack of responsiveness as a hint to be quieter, not noisier, not throw more things at the issue, right? Rethink metrics. Find new ways of measuring performance that may sit outside of classic engagement metrics. Radically simplify things like forms, right? We just invented a service for Berkshire Hathaway called Three. It's a new small insurance product. For, uh, um, uh, it's not even called Berkshire Hathaway. It's called Three because you only need three steps to get your application filled out instead of the hundreds of steps today. So just that quieter functionality was so powerful to the company that they named their company after that limited, that quieter functionality. Invest in content design. I cannot speak highly enough about the value of having really good content designers because if you're gonna go quieter, each communication better be more powerful and great and movable uh, content is the way to get there. Measure also the cognitive effort that you expect from your customers, right? What is their uh, mental strain on dealing with your brands, dealing with your messages, and how can you alter that to make it more pleasurable? And finally, one of the things, and again, Chris, you mentioned this in the keynote, employee experience. At least 40% of my opportunities out there in the world are around employee experience. It's a trend from two years ago that lives on to today that we call B to We. Right, looking inside of our organization, not just HR, but just thinking about the mental health and understanding where we are as an organization. One of the things that Accenture did was they got rid of the annual review process. We, we, we have much more regular flow-like communication that happens throughout the year, not just the magical, oh, I'm gonna find out how I'm doing now, you know, once a year, because this is about communication, right? It's about, it's about not wondering, it's about knowing at all times. So that's silence is gold. The last straw. We've heard about sustainability and global warming and the ruinous uh, nature of, of plastics in the ocean and all of that stuff for, for a while now. The reason we view this as a trend now is because consumers for the first time are really, really taking action. They think they can do about it and they're making decisions about the companies they follow and support based on this. Um, a little personal anecdote, uh, last Christmas, Yes, I know, my name is Rosenblatt and we have Christmas. My wife's not Jewish, okay, in case you're wondering. Uh, but anyway, we have Christmas and we have, a, we have a, 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 that Pollyanna thing where everybody picks a number, do you know about this? And, and you can get a gift and you open it and if you don't like it, then, or, or then the next person opens a gift and if they don't like it, they can steal from you and the next person can steal and everybody can steal, you know, just like Jesus taught. <laughs> anyway, um, but the funny part about it was that um, the gift that I got if everybody was uh, metal straws, everybody stole to get the metal straws again and again and again. Everybody is recognizing the problems that are out there. The opportunity, though, is it gives companies a chance with packaging, with services, to rethink and redesign everything. So let's just get into a little bit of the evidence here. I'm going to kind of skip ahead after this. Um, it, it is so prominent now that there, the, the Collins Dictionary made single use its word of the year. Single use, the bad form, right? Not not uh, versatile, meaning you use it once and you toss it. I think uh, in, that, in that graph there, you probably can't see, uh, in the website you will, I think, I think plastics or straws themselves 
make up 11% of the waste in the oceans. Um, so this is a great quote from the CEO of Angie, which is a massive utility company. The future of companies lies in reconciling economic performance with social and environmental sustainability. The only companies who focus on repairing the rifts in our world will grow in the long term. So this isn't just some little side item for you know, the altruists among us. This matters now to the bottom line of companies. If you look over there, uh, Everlane's um, uh, coat there is made entirely out of recycled bottles. We're seeing evidence of this. And by the way, at, at Fjord, one of the things we do is every week we have a new report that lists all the evidence behind each of these trends. And this was, is the biggest. It's like one company after another. Uh, Unilever, sustainable brands have seen on average 30% faster growth than all of their other brands. And you know, Unilever makes a ton of products. Um, Nike has undergone a change. They, they, they're leading the way with sustainable design. That uh, little shoe that you see there, the fly knit, 60% less waste than, than normal trainers. Uh, Ikea is working on being a net exporter of renewable energy in 2020. So it's starting to happen. And people are noticing and they're using those decisions that companies are make, making with their wallets. So we suggest, yes, it's an opportunity to rethink all design top to bottom collaboration to get ahead, being able to tell your stories, right? This isn't just about the features and functions of what your products do. This is about what your company stands for to make the planet better. And then, of course, thinking about how to turn waste into wealth, right? How to monetize and extract value from something that's no longer wanted. Number three, data minimalism, right? Uh, people, individuals, and organizations disagree on the value of personal data. Let's, let's just dive into this one. There's a bunch of interesting stuff here. We know that last year's events, if everybody remembers the Cambridge Analytica scandal, Facebook scandals, multiple retailer scandals, where our data was just tossed around and used improperly, um, that has kept this subject uh, um, in the news for, for quite a while now. Um, our friends at IBM right there, they just did a survey. 75% respondents said they will not buy a product from a company, no matter how great the product, if they don't trust that company to protect their data. We see it again and again. More and more mission statements are, are, are about trust for the companies that we serve. Um, the EU, the European Union, represented the, or uh, created the General Data uh, Protection Regulation, GDPR, last year, that forced companies to actually say how data is going to be used and ask for permission for things like cookies and data collection. People suddenly realized how much their data was used without their knowledge because suddenly it became law to flood people's inboxes with permissions. I get them even, even in this country for now cookies suddenly again. That was something that was in vogue like 20 years ago. Um, and then 70% of the companies around the world had still failed to comply with that about four months after it was released. That's an issue. By the way, Taylor Swift is mentioned there. because I don't know if you heard about this. She performed at the Rose Bowl, I think last May. And there was a massive kiosk. And people were running up to the kiosk to see. And it was all about the clothes she was about to wear in the concert, past concert footage, videos. What they didn't know was that secretly that kiosk was utilizing face recognition technology to match those faces against her known stalker database. Yikes, what are they doing with that data? They didn't tell anybody. People were just looking and smiling and getting into the video. And that, that, opened, that can open up a Pandora's box. Now, I would say that her being protected is a benign use, but without informing anybody or without people realizing what's being done with their face and with any data that emerges from it, kind of scary stuff. The asymmetry, though, is interesting because people's understanding of data's value is out of sync with companies. Companies are starting to realize that the aggregate of data, what you can learn from the mass of data, that contextual thing that I talked about, is actually more important than individual data. The BBC did a study, uh, before I read these trends, they did a study and they, they found that an individual's data is worth only, on average, about $10. $10 is it. So individually, it's not worth as much. Collectively, it's worth a lot. So, what we suggest is you have to set expectations and live with them. You have to embrace data minimalism. What is the least amount you can capture for the most value? It doesn't have to just be an immediate reaction to, here's what you personally are going to get, but here's how we build our products, and here's how we think about it, and your data is used for that. Be open, be transparent, and of course, champion trust. The inclusivity paradox, or as I call the death of the traditional um, persona. So 
yes, we all, as I said before, we all know that people are individuals and not types, right? Uh, companies, you can't throw a stone and not hit a company that doesn't scream about things like customer optimization and getting to know our customers and right place, right time, and all that stuff. And that's absolutely true. And we certainly value personas at Fjord as well. But personas are a reflection of past behavior. What really matters is context. So broad scale segmentation, it, it's often countercultural and sometimes it's just rude. <laughs> the, the things that we assume, right? I like this quote from uh, Netflix vice president of product. Yeah, we, everybody's instinct was you find it their age and gender data, it's fantastic. What we learned, useless, useless. And by the way, I'm still mad at Netflix because years ago I saw a great French movie called uh, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Anybody ever see that? It's about a guy, uh, true story, Vogue editor in France, uh, suddenly became paralyzed, was only able to use one eye and blinked out an entire book about his thoughts and experiences. This is true. Unfortunately, Netflix now thinks that all of the movies I want to watch are people hospitalized with diseases. <laughs> Every movie, you know, whose life is it anyway? The Elephant Man. I'm like, how about other movies by the director? So they don't have it right yet either, by the way. Um, but the question is, can we, can we design for context suddenly? Um, I say we can. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to go. We're, we're in a, uh, the group of people that you see down there are a group that are referring to themselves now as transitioners. I'm not talking about gender transitioning, I'm talking about what they're interested in. These are cross-age, cross-demo people that connect more in a community level with brands uh, that they get. It's not traditional way of understanding who people are, but you can absolutely design around it when you think about habits of mind. What we refer to often is a context called mindsets. Mindsets. It's a fluidly based, often fluidly, sometimes people are dominant and they hold to their, to their beliefs, but it's contextual. So the uh, example I often give, we work with a lot of hotel chains in Marriott, for example. If you're the work hard, play hard segment, but let's say you're flying to a Marriott property and the, plane, the flight is delayed by like three hours and you suddenly realize you're going to be at the Marriott destination uh, hours after the kitchen's closed. Who cares? Who cares what persona you're in and what might be in the room to match those data points. What matters to that family is that they're going to have a hot meal waiting for them somehow after the kitchen close. Well, armed with this, if Marriott suddenly now on a living dashboard at the front desk has access to third party data like United Flight information and knows that family will be late, they can have a meal prepared and ready. Context is what matters, not just what a demographic is. Marry the two. That's the key. So what we suggest is you marry quant and qual. Don't, not one or the other. Like I said, we do a lot of ethnographic research. One of, one of my favorite all-time stories is a real like minute moment that, that speaks volumes. So we did, um, uh, there was a, a, a massive uh, telephone company in the Nordics um, that wanted call shed, right? 90% of the call to their call center were because people were complaining about, can anybody guess, what would somebody be complaining about with a phone company? The bill. Of course, the bill. Everybody hates the bill. Nobody knows talk and text time and how that translates to money spent, and it's all confusing. So we did ethnographic research. We went into homes. We watched people do their bill and study their bill and watch their bill. And we started to, something started to emerge. There was one thing they hated more than the bill itself. It was the fact that that particular company had buried access to customer care. Now, a lot of companies do that. I mean, you, you can't you try finding uh, Amazon, right? Try finding a lot of companies where you just want a darn 800 number, or you just want a clickable, you know, to go out to customer care. But this is a company whose CEO said, we will be the most transparent phone company in the world. And yet, their service is showing that they have something to hide. So we took this, and in the end product that emerged, and we ended up doing a real-time app that is it's just the bill, but it's app, so they can compare themselves against their neighbors. They know to the second their talk and text time and how that translates to the money they will spend at the end of the month so they can mitigate their behaviors so that they will spend less at the end of the month. But if you look at the interface of the app, right down, dead center in the middle is tap for customer care. Now, if the goal, the business goal was call shed, why are you making it easier? Because we think the experience is going to be so good they won't need it, but contextually, they'll see that they can have access anytime they want, and they'll feel better from a brand perspective about the company. What happened? First three months, 50% call shed, because the experience matters. And then the context of seeing 
that available matters, right? So context matters and experience matters. So marry Quant and Qual, focus on mindsets over traditional segmentation and try to become a living business. I can do an entire talk on what a living business is, but basically it's a company that can morph and breathe much like the customers they serve, right? That aren't siloed as organizations, can think about future needs, can bifurcate between band-aiding immediate problems and thinking to the future. Ahead of the curb. Head of the curb is all about cities' infrastructures actually slowing us down. They have to combat the clutter with ecosystems that have to meet real-time needs. So it used to be easy, right? There were occasional deliveries, and there was private transport, and then there was public transport, and that's all getting messed up. And think about a brand that you adopt, buy a product. Think about that last mile issue that sometimes happens between the fulfillment depot and your front door. And when that goes awry, because the streets, say, of Paris are so narrow and the 8 billion delivery trucks trying to deliver products are going to be clogged, or the e-scooters are going to litter the highway, that starts to become a problem. So cities have to think about, and companies have to think about, non-traditional ways. Also at CES, one of the things that I saw was Bell Labs had a massive five-person floatable, it looked like a, a drone, but it was for people. It's the future of cabs. It just goes up about 20 feet in the air and takes you anywhere you need to go above all the clutter. I don't know when that's coming out, but they claim they, uh, they're beyond the prototype stage. We'll see. But companies are starting to think about it now. Um, and ticketing. Ticketing has become a big thing, right? There, there are companies now, non-traditional companies, that are thinking about not just the mode of transport, but simply getting from point A to point B. Uber is starting to allow you to buy multi-ride tickets for multiple platforms, right? Right then and there through their app. Uh, blurring the map. So we're starting to see non-traditional, like think about Nike. Nike is now starting to offer curb service. They're starting to actually bring vehicles, often electric vehicles, right to curbside. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, that's a, a bus from a retailer. It's an e-bus, a retailer uh, that is actually about to launch in Helsinki to take people to and from stores. Um, all kinds of products are starting to emerge that blend the traditional notion of how am I going to get there? It doesn't matter, but the point A to point B and companies thinking about how I'm going to allow for that, not to mention the last mile, are hugely important. So design for moving from one point to another. Uh, remember that last mile and remember partnerships, right? It is really, really important. You're, we're not going to get at a new solution for mobility ourselves. We have to think about partners that can help us get there together and rethink what our brand is. Space Odyssey. Work and retail spaces need a digital makeover. One of the problems with companies like Sears that are going out of business is they didn't adapt. They didn't need to go out of business. They could have adopted the digital mindset in their own stores to make a difference. There is actually starting to be a retail renaissance. So a couple of things you're seeing here. Um, in the bottom center, Amazon is, we all know about Amazon Go, right? Where you can, you can just grab a product and leave. The app's open in the background. You never have to see a cashier. You never have to, you just walk out with the products and the app kind of reads it all. What they're also doing is they're creating stores where every product in the store is a product that it got at least a four-star review online, right? So again, the notion of digital informing a physical space. People know that everything I'm about to see got great ratings online. I am far more inclined to stick around in that store and pick up products because I, it already cleared a hurdle for me in my mindset. On the right side is, uh, the bottom right is a Nike store specifically designed for people who hate going to physical stores, right? So it has, a, uh, it has a, an opportunity for you to do very, very fast customization of shoes, much like you could. I mean, one of the best things about um, uh, in the automotive industry uh, the websites are very elegant usually if you go to Mercedes or BMW and you build your own car, right? And you can make it red suddenly and you can change the wheels and I'm going to add a roof rack. Now I'm going to take it off and all that. The problem is that doesn't connect with the actual supply chain at the end of the story. It's just folly. What that Nike store aims to do is to make that kind of experience red, no green, no, just as uh, available here. So you can swap through digital notions and actually see the shoe being created right there before your eyes. Digital informing physical. And then the same goes for workspace. Workspace is changing too. Um, it's funny, we work in an open office. I bet most of the agencies here and brands are, are going that way too. But I just saw an interesting um, study that revealed that open offices actually are far less productive because 
people talk to each other less because they're right next to each other and they're jamming their headphones on to avoid dealing with each other. Ah, there's the recognition and the, yeah, I mean, Lord knows I do it. Um, now, that's not to say that open offices are wrong, but we have to rethink what people are actually doing and not just assume collaboration is key, therefore no barriers. Um, WeWork is changing their whole model to not just offer very cool workspace, but to actually be a digital or a, a consultant in terms of the future of your own workspace. Um, so, so there are retail implications, there are office implications in terms of rethinking our physical environments. So let online behaviors inform offline. Mind the gaps between the two. Link space and business strategy as well. Your space should be reflective of how you want to treat customers and then create that ultimate connected ecosystem. And finally, finally, synthetic reality. So I already talked a little bit about it, uh, face swapping, voice simulation, they, they create these synthetic realities. Companies have to think about what does that mean in terms of authenticity and what should we be scared of and what can we actually take advantage and capitalize on? So a couple of things going on. Um, in the upper right, I don't know if you remember, in April of last year, a video emerged and went viral of Obama, genteel, proper Obama, saying awful, curse-laden things about Trump. And it went wildfire, and there he is saying it right there. I don't have the volume up, but he says it, and it's, it's ugly. It's not him. It's not him. He didn't say any other words. You'd never know it. It was simulated based on thousands of you know, pieces of digital footage, obviously his voice, and that was created. On the bottom left, China News Agency, that's their new anchor, he is not real. He is synthetic. I'll work you tirelessly, it'll be typed into my system uninterrupted, and that's the, uh, the, the China agency. It's an experiment to lower production costs. If I don't have to you know, spend a fortune on bombshell reporters <laughs> and I can just make that happen, why not do it? And of course, you know, the old Photoshop has now turned into moving Photoshop where you can turn a horse into a zebra and you can go on and on and on and on. So what is truth anymore? Well, truth can actually be wonderful. There are, there are a lot of simulations of things like brain functionality that are going on now. There are entertainment uh, items like this pop star in Japan. She's not real, obviously. She has, I think, more Instagram followers than anybody in the world right now. And she's not real. Um, Dove, Baby Dove in the UK just did a campaign. Now, this was tongue in cheek. They used a, a technology called GAN to look at every representation of motherhood that existed in advertising forms to create the quote unquote perfect real mom. It's not real, it's tongue in cheek, but it was, it's showing, it was quickly showing is we are representing an unreality here. And by the way, that painting up in the upper right, Edmund DeLessie, it's part of the DeLessie family. They have uh, portraits painted. Uh, that one sold for $432,000 at Christie's just a couple of months ago. It was created entirely by AI. It wasn't real, wasn't painted by a human. It was, and that family doesn't exist either. Um, so we have to reframe what authentic is. The good news, by the way, is that we shouldn't be so scared, I think, of this. I mean, people adopted CGI really fast. People adopted other non-reality forms of entertainment and, and consumption. I think the real value in this is using synthetic reality as teaching tools and as branding ourselves and be clear with our audience what's real and how to prepare for it. And exploring synthetic realities as a creative tool and a resource and ultimately harnessing the power of AI generated images for things like medical learning and other things. So those are the seven trends and I just wanna leave you with this. There is always a macro trend that we come up with every year. A couple years ago that still lives is something we call liquid expectations. It's about how people's expectations are not just about your direct competitors anymore. If they had a great onboarding experience in Amazon, they expect that same for a bank, right? That's liquid. So today's is the thirst for value, right? After, after all these years, we're actually seeing Two people, two sets of audiences wonder, how valuable is my world right now? There, there's the company that's spent 20 years investing in digital, and then there are consumers like us who have had digital thrown at us, and we're now using. Where is the value in all that? We're actually at an innovation plateau, a little bit of a flat point in the S-curve. So new products and services are going to become mainstream, but we can actually think about it. It's like a digital cleaning we can do right now. And the questions are being asked, like, what does a brand, does a brand deserve space in my life? We often say to people, don't think about 
you joining a loyalty program, you have to think about the company being loyalty, loyal to you. That's what really matters today. The winners are going to be organizations that become ecosystems, right? Not monoliths. And it requires a mindset shift, ultimately. Actually, be quiet and don't shout and be relevant or don't be there at all. And know your customers, but in a contextual way, not an old school way. And do less, not more, right? It is a counterintuitive notion, but we think that the the future of value, and hopefully you saw value as a through line for all of these things, that's what it's based on. And that's it. So I think there's the moderator portion now. <laughs> 35 minutes-ish? That was, that was amazing. <laughs> I think, uh, and I'm a loud enough talker, I may not need this. Let's see, is this on? Yeah. Um, man, <laughs> I, I, I have four words in my mind right now, which mm -hmm. is, you, smart, me, dumb. <laughs> that, that was, I'm just sitting here, it was dizzying. And uh, you, you need to- So easy a caveman can do you it. You need to easy. put a bigger font on your slides because the, the, every point, I'm trying to scramble mm. down the note. You promised us a link, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's not there, but I'll, sa I'll send a link to you, somebody and they can send it to all the attendees. But I can tell you right now, quickly, it's trends.fjordnet, F-J-O-R-D, net, N-E-T, dot com trends.fjordnet.com and you'll get all of these but with like layers and layers of more information and evidence. I need a minute. Yeah. Trends.fjordnet. Fjordnet.com? Yeah. Well, that doesn't seem that smart. Yeah. Why are you putting net and dot com? Well, we have, I think fjord was taken because the damn real natural fjords on the earth were <laughs> <Yeah>. taken. <laughs> they, they got there first. They got there, the <laughs> actual fjords got there before <laughs> yeah. our company. Well, that's fair. <laughs> Um, so those of you that aren't familiar with this, uh, go to your Twitter, uh, tweet into Gathering, I think it's Accenture, yeah, Gathering Accenture, and I'll do my best to try to get to some of your questions. I get to selfishly ask a few things. Sure. Um, years ago, yeah. 12 years ago, we were working with Hyatt, mm -hmm. and Hyatt had the CMO became the CTO at the same time, wore both hats. Yeah. And people like yourself were sitting around saying, that's the future, marketing is becoming more technical, the, the, seat, the traditional CTO role is dead, and we haven't seen it, uh, at least organizationally. Certainly marketing has gotten more tech-centric, but I mean, I would imagine part of what Accenture Interactive is trying to do is collide these two worlds much faster. Are, is the CMO winning or is the CTO winning and is one holding the other one back? How's that happening? <laughs> we, uh, there's, I could give you evidence either way for sure. We have seen um, in sort of our, and I, I work at the cross section of all North American new business. So most of who I talk to between those two audiences stunningly tends to be CTOs. And that's not just because they uh, were the old school, you know, Accenture connections. It's because they're creeping into experience and the, um, the notion of what their platforms and their technical needs, how that ties into experiences, they're starting to get it. I'm not saying, saying CMOs are shut out. They exist powerfully in most organizations still, and the two have to sync. We do not see a merge still, to your point, either, uh, of those two disciplines, but we see CTOs um, recognizing that they have to play a much more of a vast role and not just be sort of you know, glorified Uber you know, IT folk. But who has the, the, like when you guys do a conference, when you think about some of this technology that's being sold, is it being bought by the CTO more often to enable the marketing yes. division? Yes, yeah, I'd say it leans a little bit more that way. And obviously our success is contingent upon the right kind of CTO and the recognition that it must, must, must serve a, a grander purpose, right? Um, it, it's, you know, Accenture used to be in the business of, you know, platform re-implementations simply based on, you know, tangential evidence instead of actual exploration of needs and pain points. That has changed markedly, and um, CTOs recognize that. So they, they uh, in the smarter organizations, tend to be the buyers because they get that and have started to weave their way across the organization. You mentioned a, a point about silence is gold, and, and we've been preaching for a while this idea that marketers, marketers used to be valued for how well we could talk, yeah. how creative, how clever, how funny we could be, and yeah. in the new world order, marketers need to learn how to shut up and listen. <laughs> right. um, how, well, how does that coincide? Are you saying silence is gold in the sense that create 
oases that, that free people from the bombardment? Or are you saying within that silence of you not trying to talk, you can now listen, there's something to learn? And yeah. if, if the latter, how are you helping people listen? Yeah, it's a, it's a little more than that. One, uh, it's a little more of the second um, point because you know one of the things that, that we advocate a lot, I'm, I'm sure um, there, there are vast research engines across all of the, the brands and the, and the marketing teams here. I'm not here to suggest they're not. But the, the, that, that point is blended in with the point of that inclusivity paradox. When we're not actually shadowing, like actually out there, shadowing current experiences, watching and exploring, taking a breath, and just watching what is relevant and needed, like the, the end button example I gave, which was very UI you know, centric, but it was based on a, on, a, on a grander truism, that's more or less what we mean. We mean that take a breath and actually explore. And, and ethno understand what your uh, what the actual pain points are. It is amazing the degree to which survey data only gets at a small bit of the story because people will fill things in. And what people will say different things than what they actually do. And when you have the right kind of researchers in the field, as they say, actually observing and and being mindful, um, it is amazing what you can breathe and learn and the insights that you can gather to then shape shift a little bit of the service behind it. That's part of what we mean. And also, um, we're getting it, we said gold, not golden. Golden would have been the old cliche, but gold is there's a, there's a monetary value also to fewer but more impactful messages along the way that are based on that research with strong content design and things like that. So yeah, so I think the question here was, how can you be quiet if people don't know who you are? And I think, I think what you're saying is don't, uh, don't feel so compelled to just start shouting so that I'm over here. Right. But be very thoughtful about what you're going to say and then show up in a fewer, bigger, better way. Yep, yep, absolutely. Um, you talked about the death of the traditional persona, and I think that's really interesting because I, I, I would argue most of us are still operating in that world, and I believe the genesis of the persona made sense in a media buying world because media yes. was sold demographically, therefore personas became demographically. Yeah, and, excuse me, apparently reaching puberty. Puberty, still. congratulations. <laughs> Yay, I'm a real boy now. Um, I, I don't know what happened there, um, but... Uh, where the hell was I? We're what, talking what? about personas and, and why yes. why the demographic one is yeah. antiquated and why the contextual one yeah. is far superior. Yeah, uh, and and again, one of the key points, lest you think that I'm I'm saying throw out the baby with the bathwater, I'm most certainly not because um, personas certainly inform. We still create them as as a quick mirror into kind of broad audience segments. The the key is that mind the gaps though, like what what sits in between them, and when something happens contextually, how does it matter? Of course traditional media uh, buying is based on those measures that sort of force us to bucket people, at least to a degree. Um, but for services to thrive, for us to have features and functionalities and, and you know, products with service wrapped around them that are more interesting and inquisitive, then you need to know what sits between them. What, one of the, um, when, when I said that the, you know, culturally it can be rude, take, take the Muslim uh, clothing market, for example. It's, like, it's a, uh, Muslim women specifically, it's a 254 billion market, dollar market that has barely been scratched by the West, barely been scratched because there's still an assumption, a bias, that they're all basically the same. You know? And yes, you can change out your hijabs and so on, but there's a lot more to it than that. And, and Muslim women are incredibly stylish and have incredibly diverse needs, no matter what the, 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 uh, the traditional um, uh, clothing biases might be. So that's what I mean. Like, Spend time to actually learn and not just assume that an audience means this or that. It could mean something right in between. You kind of uh, glazed over this idea. I think it was 10% of the population is going to live in 41 cities mm -hmm. by 2030. Yeah. Uh, what, are, what are those cities and, and how are they adapting to this? Um, Banff? Uh, <laughs> no. We I, told the mayor earlier. <laughs> yeah, get ready. Get ready. Um, I think it was your, you know, we are, you know, it's like the bit, a lot of, a couple of the big Asian cities, New York, uh, we see more in New York. We see, we. There's no surprises in there's, there. There's no surprises in there other than um, the sustainability trend forcing people out of some particular areas, right? Into, um, you know, away from the equator, away from water, low lying water areas, things like that. And uh, one of the um, one of the issues with with particularly dense cities like like Venice and Paris and all that 
is that the infrastructure, you know, built many, many years before any of, of the USA's uh, cities were built, really, really, really narrow. And it's, it's forcing um, such clogs that in, in Paris, one of the things that happened was e-scooters just completely took off. And it's actually the most rapidly growing form of transportation there is. I think, remember originally we had e-dash everything and then we switched to i? I think it's going back to e because electricity is the root of all of those little examples I gave. But the scooters then became such a clutter problem because there was nowhere to actually park them that they just began cluttering the streets. And they were just outlawed in Paris. So there's all kinds of... There are all kinds of issues to overcome. Uh, and maybe a lot of what I Maybe the segue is going to come back. Maybe the segue is going to come back. A lot of what I saw or CES were answers that went this way <laughs> instead of this way, right? It, 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 responses that are going to take us up in the air now. That creates a whole sort of hybrid oversight system that's going to be nightmarish as well. But that's what's happening. Star Wars figured it out. Yeah. I'm sure there's yeah, they got it somewhere. The, um, you, some of the stuff about beyond the curb, is, I think, is fascinating as a consumer. You think about Uber Eats and skip the dishes and stuff like that. But um, I also think about uh, like a shopping mall. Twenty five percent of that footprint is parking. Yeah. And so, in a world where that doesn't have to happen, that's, exactly. a, that's a lot less money that has to go out to build the spot, and everybody's yep. now just getting dropped off or autonomous. Yeah. You didn't mention anything about autonomous driving, and that's something that everybody seems to be very vogue right now. Is, is that a trend that you guys have your eye on? Oh, yeah. We're, we're looking at that, too. That tied in with the trend we had last year. We actually, um, it's funny, my daughter goes to the, the one who squeezes limes into her mom's drink. Um, she now goes to the University of Pittsburgh, and somehow is not a drunk. Um, Congratulations. Yes. So there's that. I have, I have very low expectations. So. Um, but when I was visiting her one time, I actually saw Pittsburgh is one of the epicenters of the autonomous driving um, tests. And I actually saw them, um, you know, going around. The, now, there have been, um, there's been some negative press about that because of, you know, a couple of deaths. Um, but no, they, there, there have been some, some reasons to sort of take pause. But we saw that, that as uh, completely dominant still in the near future. Um, probably in 10 years, we're going to see them readily. I think what that's going to force is different kinds of wider um, roadways, different traffic patterns, different light situations to allow for that. One, one of the issues with autonomous driving now is that um, really sharp surprises, they haven't quite caught up to yet. So, you know, they drive along and they can follow a car slowing down, but when that, if that car darts away, they, they often hit the car in front, which led to actually one of those awful accidents. Um, but we absolutely see that as part of the mix, autonomous driving. Uh, we're out of time, Matt, but just my, the last thought. I mean, Matt was a traditional creative director yes. and a copywriter, and this is your new world, and you've done it masterfully. I think that should give hope for people in marketing or at ad agencies to say, I, too, can thrive in this new environment, yeah. but your skills have to change, and it's about experience design more than print ad design that will be uh, the, the next generation. Yes, and I, I love me a print ad. For sure. I've wrote many of them, and I love them, because you have to say so much and so little. It's, yeah. There's an art. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Rosenblatt. Thank you.